lounge and sun. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan. And back with me, one of my favorite people on the planet, Michelle Bond, is with me. We're going to be talking some of her new stuff. We haven't talked in a while on the channel, so I'm very excited to have you back. Ryan, I'm certain you say my favorite person is on to everybody that comes on the show, but I believe you. No, and you back, can check all my videos. You. I've never said it to anybody else. Hey, so. but even if it, even if that's not true, back at you. <laughs> you are one Thank of the you. most enthusiastic, true blue people in comics. I really believe there are only a handful of people out there who care about the greater good of publishing and all of it from sales and marketing to content and editorial. So great to be back. Well, thank you for the compliments as well. I I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Like before we get into, I know you have a Kickstarter that's running. Uh, there's only a few days left. So get out there and support it. I'll have the link down below for everybody to get out there. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the last book that we weren't able to connect with on uh, Fast Times and Comic Book Editing. And that's the second of in the trilogy of your comic book editing books. And this one is different than Filth and Grammar because this one is a lot more comics than it is instruction. Why the choice to kind of break it up in, in this format with the trilogy? Like what's the third one going to be then? Well, to walk backwards a second, yeah. my evil plan with Filth and Grammar, as you know, was I wanted to make a handbook that I wish I had in the 90s when I was coming up in comics and had to learn trial by fire how to edit. So I look at Filth and Grammar as 80% how to make comics step-by-step step, from idea to great idea to finished comic with 80% how to do it and 20% sequential comic book art. And as you know, my partner in comics crime, Image and Mangle, who is, is really, I think, the next big name to watch in comics because she's oh, yeah. a cartoonist as well, great so. writer, amazing artist, 24 years old. Can't believe that she's so accomplished at this age. What I did with Phil Fast Times was the opposite ratio. So there is 20% learning the craft, especially in the back of Fast Times. You probably remember I put my red pen notes in the back over a story that I did with yeah. Peter Gross and Mike Carey about Mike Carey's memory on what happened when we first met at San Diego Comic-Con, which was not what happened because <laughs> if it did, my parents would disown me. But it was a lot of fun to... Uh, tussle about what real events happened and doing it by showing how to proofread and edit on paper. But with Fast Times, I also had a lot to say about my life in the 90s in New York City. So mm -hmm. it's 80% sequential comics. And I was able to invite a lot of my friends and colleagues from back in the day to actually contribute little pieces. And for me, Comics and music always go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I know you know that because we talk about that a lot. Yeah. But with Filth and Grammar, I wanted it to be a handbook that you could throw at the wall. You could have dog-eared corners and use a highlighter and you use your own red pen and make notes and use it for your whole career. Kind of like people use um, the elements of style by Strunk and White. It's like a, a, a go-to must-have on your reference library shelf if you want to edit anything from mm -hmm. newspaper articles to comics. Fast Times, I wanted to look like a music magazine, especially the ones I read from England back in the 90s. So there was a whole series of fashion and music magazines like Select and ID and The Face. And while I was making comics in the 90s nonstop and hanging out at St. Mark's Place in St. Mark's Comics on the weekends and sounds and dojos, I wanted to make sure that my love for music came through. So that's how I designed the chapters in Fast Times. So you get some story, sequential storytelling. You get these. And then you also these. get right the um, areas where it's almost a little bit of a salute to Jamie Reed of punk design fame and interviews. And I did ask other contributors to weigh in because as much as it's very easy to do auto bio mm -hmm. and just make it about me, 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 it's a lot about me. It's written by me. These are my memoirs, but other points of view are critical. So Mark DeMattis, for instance, wrote 
a beautiful essay about oh, I loved it. Yeah. free vertigo. And I couldn't have said those things because he was the one who told Karen Berger about the job that was available at DC Comics. She interviewed, she began working as Paul Levitz's assistant and that's how her career started. And for her longtime friend, Mark Dematis, to tell that story was so much better than anything I could have even you know, conjured up had I talked to her about it. Yeah, I think it's such a great collection. I mean, I'm like flipping through it as we're talking and there's just like between the different stories that you tell between the chapter breaks where you give like some more facts about yourself and like even like the collage aspect of like old photos and then you have like so a student ID, I mean, and um, you know, so many people, you know, so many fucking cool people in comic books and like, <laughs> So just getting to see them all like in here and getting to hear your perspective on that stuff. I, cause like, I'm sure you could do like probably three more books with the stories you have. I, this is not even everything, right? This to me, right. this didn't even scratch the surface of Thanks. what your experience has been like in comic books, but it was just so cool to see it and then see all these people. Like even in the end, I was like, as I was flipping, I forgot about the Gerard way, the intern that got away that you yes. put in the back. <laughs> like but that made me I laugh. I stretched the truth a little bit with that one because we did connect uh, more intensely in the later years, but I really wanted him drawn in the book because he was pivotal. I mean, meeting him in those early days when I was going to the School of Visual Arts a lot, um, I, I think I mentioned in the book that I taught a semester in 1998. And here's the coolest thing. In the past three months, two of my former students from that small class, I think I had 10 or 12 students at the School of Visual Arts. I've reconnected with two of them through my teaching, which is bizarre. Mm -hmm. So it's just great to know it all comes full circle. But but trying to explain to people how you make connections in life, not just in comics, but you make connections everywhere. And there's really nowhere to hide, not just because we you know we can connect on social media every 10 minutes, but it's important that you you're careful and you're kind to people as you make your way up the ladder because you're going to go up the ladder and then someone's going to step on your fingers. You're going to fall down a few rungs, but you're going to still keep climbing up and every connection you make on the along the way is important. And I must say though, not everyone that's mentioned in that book still talks to me. Mm -hmm. So when you're in comics, it's very possible that you uh, annoy pe people and you make mistakes. And sometimes other people make mistakes and don't apologize. And you just have to remember that every time your teeth hit the pavement, you got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, move forward. The people that don't come with you, that's okay. Cause people do change, but just stay the course for yourself. And that's pretty much what that I think is the operational theme of my entire trilogy. You're right. I could probably write four or five more books, but like, honestly, I'm too exhausted to do that. And I hate writing. Well, what, how do you edit your own life though? I mean, that's basically what you're doing. You're basically editing out what you think. I mean, deciding what stories you want to tell, right? What memories that you want to share with us. Cause like I said, I'm sure there's stuff that you could have shared, but you chose not to. So how, how did you decide what to include? How much stuff did you have kind of like maybe in that first draft and then pulled later? A ton. And it's not easy. And because I hate writing so much, because I will always say I'm an editor who letters and writes, but doesn't like to write, you know, I'll letter anything. And I am the greatest frustrated designer in the world. So anytime graphic design is needed, I'm on it. Writing is hard. And writing is hard because when it's done well, it's lean and mean. And you don't stumble. You don't feel like you need to pull out a thesaurus or a dictionary to understand what someone's saying. It's so much easier to critique someone else's work. You know, I, f I fess up. It is, you know, it is true. I would much rather rip someone else's prose to ribbons than to bite my nails over editing myself. But that's why I have an editor. Will Potter is amazing. He's mm -hmm. also a tremendous writer and bass player. You know, he's in the Cud Band. They just played like a whole series of gigs in England that I'm sorry I missed. But Will's real talent for me is his experience in book publishing 
and putting together his own kids books and writing and also drawing. And that has helped me as an editor who letters and sometimes writes, it's helped me with structure a lot. Um, although he's a serial comma enthusiast. And so I find myself sometimes getting confused. British editors are nuts about the serial comma. American comic book editors, not so much because of the tangents. So mm -hmm. I am more than likely to just obliterate commas when I can, if there are reasons in that word balloon for me to not easily read something. Mm -hmm. But Ryan, I'll tell you like the trick that I use that's worked for me when it comes to deciding what should stay in the book and what shouldn't. I think it's important to free write every day. So at eight o'clock every morning, I free write in my pajamas, on my phone, whatever comes out. It's usually a bad dream. It's often things I forgot to do the day before. But if you isolate the dialogue that needs to happen between two characters, in, in a scene, whether it's from your life or whether it's from a project you're working on, I think that's a great way in. So I started each book with a timeline of my life and I gave myself 15 minutes with my little chicken timer. Mm -hmm. And 50, in 15 minutes, I do a timeline of my life. And the things that I remember most are gonna come out first. And from there, I try to think about what were the conversations that really mattered most, good and bad. And then how do I make them active? Because as you know from Filth and Grammar, action is character. Those are my three words. Mm -hmm. So I always try to think about, you know, what will I have an artist draw? Because nine times out of 10, there are too many talking heads and too many giant word balloons in a comic book. So I deconstruct comic books that I love and what works. And I try to provide that on the page, but ultimately you have to write for yourself. You have to be comfortable with what you're revealing. And honestly, I didn't want to get sued, which is why it's taking me longer to finish up my doppelganger, but it's going to be worth it. I swear. I know it'll be worth it. I mean, I just, I love filth and grammar and I love fast times as well. I think they're both awesome. It's cool to kind of get like this extra peek into your life and like these like memories, you know, cause like, and being able to see them drawn out must be fun too for you, you know, like to get to see stuff that happened in your life and you're not just writing it down and putting it into words, but then to have a visual piece, a component well, to it. Yes. I mean, if you think about it, I spent about 30 years like working really hard with like, like tons of artists and writers, mm -hmm. veterans and newcomers, giving people their first break. And it, it's so gratifying, but after a while, you, you know, you really want your own voice to be heard because I always say that if you don't do it yourself, you will be written out of the history books because really no one has your back. You'll meet a handful of people along the way who might help you out. And that's amazing. And always be kind and do unto others and do no harm and every adage you can think of. But unless you really are committed to telling your own story, other people have their own lives to worry about. You know, people get busy and it's just what happens. And I, and I say that without malice. I just think people are, we're selfish, you know, we're human and we should leave our mark. So that's why I'm doing it. And I think, you know, over the pandemic, I think we all sort of had that come to Jesus moment where our mortality um, was mm -hmm. obviously in question. We, we turned on the news and every day we're hearing of thousands of deaths and yeah. we all know people that died and we still have these life events that change us dramatically so you have to wake up every day and remember like you're here for a finite amount of time do what makes you happy and help other people along the way which is again why i teach because i really believe the next generation is going to save comics because my generation didn't do a great job so i want to help the people that are just getting started now have a good shot yeah i mean i think that and I, I think it's funny, too, because like ever since I have been reading comics, I mean, I can always point to an article where it's like, oh, I'm not going to be around in five years. There's not much time <laughs> left, you know, and it's like it's a constant thing. And it's like, well, it keeps chugging along somehow. Somehow it survives. You know, it's like comic industry is like a cockroach. Like it just won't. It's not gonna, <laughs> it's not going to die. So uh, I, yeah, I love, love that you that. teach. Yeah. And I um, love that you teach because like I've learned so much from just our conversations, you know, whether it's been on the channel or off you know off the recording and 
you have such a good mind for it that you not teaching would be doing a disservice to the next generation. Wow. That's high praise. Can I put that on a t-shirt? <laughs> yeah. Put that on a t-shirt, please. Okay. Thank you. So before we get into the new project, you have been doing like these zines, um, you know, you got angst farm and this death by misadventure. First of all, this paper stock. Yes. I'm right? in love with this paper. Me too. Stock. Me too. It is something else. It's a manga stock. And I'm I'm not going to lie. I stole this entire format, which is a six by nine uh -huh. from Noah Van Skyver. When I read Maple Terrace, which is my new favorite comic. So good. I could not stop thumbing the paper and pouring my eyes over the comic. I, I subscribed to it immediately from Uncivilized Books. Mm -hmm. And then it gave me the guts to say, okay, I'm going to take a little break from I Doppelganger because it was kind of kicking my butt. And I'm going to put my summer camp memoirs down on paper and comics. So I found my format. And so I'm going to be using this for a while. It is a beautiful stock. It's, as you notice, it's not pure white. So it's yeah. an off-white color. It soaks up ink like nobody's business. I know, it's so good. And I used it in the second printing of Filth and Grammar in the handbook. So I'm going to send you a copy of that. I believe you have the Kickstarter version, which is a little more boutique and mm -hmm. shiny. But yeah. for your enthusiasm for all my work, I'm going to just send you a, a handbook. That's the second printing uses that paper stock so that's the one you can actually draw in and make notes so that's my paper stock now for most of my teaching books and also for anything even my dummy book for suddenly summer camp yeah i think everything should be printed on this kind of paper i it's hate the, i hate i hate the glossy paper that comics are printed on it just to me it's like and a collection is different Right. You know, like I can accept in a collection, but like single issues, like I just, I love the, the tactile of it, you know, like just like the feeling and like the smell of the paper yeah, too is totally. like really good. So, and it bulks up beautifully. This is 32 mm -hmm. pages. You get your money's worth. And yeah. for $6, it's the cheapest I could sell it and still save my shirt, basically. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to crunch numbers, whether you're crowdfunding or whether you're self publishing. And, you know, it's tough. Philip and I have been running off register press um, as an LLC for the past two years. And at tax time, you know, we are just sick to our stomachs because it's a fortune. That's the hard part is having to pay taxes when you're self-publisher, when you crowdfund, it costs you a lot of money um, on the back end. Mm -hmm. So we look at ourselves as a startup, but we are doing other things to raise funds to publish, including selling artwork as needed which is soul crushing, mm -hmm. but it must be done. And I find it, there's a poetic justice in it. I'm selling a really important piece of art this weekend at a live auction. It, it's not easy to do, but I really, A, have to, because like everybody, I have a kid and a mortgage. I have a kid in college, but also after a while you have a piece of art. And even if it was gifted to you, it's really special but there are other people who would actually cherish it. So there's that part of me that feels like to make comics, sometimes you have to sell comics. And sometimes yeah. that means parting with a James Jean painting that was given to me okay. as a gift for giving him his first job in comics. But I told him he understands and he said he hoped it helps. And so I'm grateful to him that he appreciated my editorial input for all those years on fables and he get, he gifted me this painting when my son was born and my son is 19 now so there there's just you know it's the state of our times it's the state of the industry it's the state of ageism and sexism in comics but whatever it is his kindness to me is going to help me make more comics so cheers james yeah that's awesome and i mean you and you didn't even have to say anything to him either you know like most people probably wouldn't even said something so the fact that you even felt that need to tell him and be like listen you know like i know you did this but i i need to do this and i think that that's well it's... somebody told me that 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 it was a classy thing to do it is but yeah. comics people you know there used to be someone in my office who used to always say thank you know thanks for being classy meaning it's sarcastic when someone would do something ridiculous mm -hmm. 
I always thought that was funny, but you know, there's so much truth and sarcasm and, you know, people should be classy. The last thing I would want is for someone to go on eBay and see a piece of artwork that they gifted to me, you know, made available because who else would have put it there? So mm -hmm. it goes back to my whole theory about comics, about, you know, business. It's like, you have to always anticipate problems. So you want to be straight up and you want to get in front of a problem. And so to do that, sometimes you have to put yourself on the line. So, yeah. you know, do I feel tacky? Hell yeah. Do I want to do it? Hell no. Am I going to do it anyway? You bet. And I'm going to blame my dad for that. My dad taught me so many life lessons. I know I've talked about him on the show before. Mm -hmm. He's 85, still gets up every morning and goes to work still has his maxims and you know so many times I've called him in the past two years just just being bummed about stuff and he'll still say to me I have two words for you and we'll both say boo hoo at the same time because mm -hmm. that was how I was that's how I grew up you know I wasn't a diva I wasn't a princess when there was a problem my dad would say dust yourself off and get get moving mm -hmm. jump back in I raised you to be tougher than that yeah, you're definitely you're definitely one tough woman. That's for sure. Let's talk about suddenly one summer camp from hell. So this is also auto bio stuff, but this is before your career in comics. So what kind of made you just like, where did the idea come from to kind of tell this part of your life? Well, like a lot of kids, I was bullied at summer camp at one of my overnight camps. So I thought, I don't just want to tell that story. And honestly, I don't want to terrorize a nation of people because, you know, those kinds of summer camp stories can be really brutal. So I started to wonder, you know, if I looked back at my arc, you know, everybody now in comics knows that characters have arcs. So you, all we want to see in stories, in my opinion, is transformation, mm -hmm. no matter what genre you're talking about. We love to see the underdog get justice or we like to see the evil rock star actually suddenly become humble and then maybe lead a life of crime so i i went back and i thought well if i want to tell my summer camp stories once and for all and believe me my husband's first tweet about this campaign was somebody please fund my my wife's campaign i've heard about these stories for 20 years now it's your turn so <laughs> That says it all. But I knew if I wanted to tell the story about when I was like really bullied in 1980, I had to go back to the beginning because most of my years at camp were actually a lot of fun. And I decided that I wanted to show my character arc from sort of gung-ho, brave kid explorer who discovers she's allergic to nature, which by the way, still allergic to nature and dogs and cats and horses and have allergy shots once a month. But I went from going to a day camp where hell was very tiny hell. It was going on the nature walk with a big wad of tissues in my pocket, mm. or it was the first camp overnight where I had an asthma attack because I was sleeping outdoors and I shouldn't have done that. And it, that was all in issue one. That's all the early years to the second issue because it's a three-parter, where I go to a four-week overnight camp, and I'm the youngest camper, so I am discovering all kinds of new things. And the third book will be those later years, which include going to overnight camp with, with a bunch of kids who grew up together, who thought I was a weirdo because I had better taste in music than they did. We'll go into that, of course. Yeah. But the, the key to this journey is that I after that summer, I said, no more camp. I'm not going back to camp. But I needed a job. So I took a job at the day camp I went to as a kid. And I was a counselor in training. And I worked my way up to counselor and music and drama counselor. So I had a real full 360 from that kid with the Band-Aid on mm -hmm. her elbow and on her knee. And, you know, the I called myself a mess magnet because even during arts and crafts, I just had glue and glitter all over me. <laughs> I'm a dry cleaner's daughter. So I, I, I kind of felt like I was allowed to get messy, but the truth is, is I was a bit of a klutz. But by the end of this three-parter, I think what you will see is this very similar arc in terms of character that I had in my career in comics. 
because you kind of have to start out being a mess, finding your way, making mistakes, making friends, making enemies, making up for lost time. And when there there is trouble along the way, how to look back on it and learn something. So that's one of the reasons why suddenly one summer camp from hell is all ages, because my plan is not to share a cautionary tale or a moral per se. It's to show that when you're a kid, all these things that feel horrible and wrong, you're working them out as you go. Mm -hmm. So even the times that you feel really bad and when there are tears and there are lots of tears, you know, it it's okay. You got to shed some tears. You have to break some bones. Sometimes you have to scuff up, scuff up your knees to get to that place where you can shine. And so my latest tagline for this book is show me the kid who survived summer camp and I'll show you a force of nature because who we are now isn't always maybe who we thought we would be, Mm -hmm. but it's the art of becoming that really sets us apart. You know, I never went to overnight summer camp and I always was not fascinated by it. But like, I always wondered like, man, would that have been fun? Or would I have wanted to get the fuck out of there (laughs) immediately and go home? You know, the answer is the answer is yes. It's both of those things. And people that have backed this book have many of them have told me about their bad experiences. And many have told me about their good experiences. It's a mixed bag always. So yeah, I thought it was an excuse to um, do an all ages book where I felt like I could actually share a story that really got me to a place where I'm proud to have experienced all those really low times because they got me here. Yeah. So I guess it's a, it's just a chance to say, if your parents make you go to overnight camp, make the best of it. Here's what I did. Hopefully it can help you. And I was the kid who hid, hid in the craft cabin, by the way, you know, I was the not into sports shocking mm-hmm. to you i'm sure not I don't play right sports either so but like you know you gotta you gotta pitch in and do the do the the lame things to also have fun with the good things mm-hmm. the best part of this particular story though is working with liz prince yeah i mean liz's art is phenomenal and we've worked together a few times before on eve stranger uh she helped us out with the backup stories which was phenomenal she did um a hey amateur story about how to catch frogs and toads, which is why I thought about her, because Mm -hmm. I thought there's one person who probably loved summer camp and it had to be bug and frog enthusiast, Liz Prince, Mm -hmm. who just released science comics, frogs. She has a new book out. Oh, cool. That is phenomenal that I think your daughter will love. Um, It's gross. I mean, it's gross, meaning it's about frogs. You know, it's just frogs can be cute though. She did tell me that. And I believe her kind of. She draws cute frogs. Yeah, I, I'll I'll definitely be on the lookout for that because I really dig her art. And I, I knew I re- recognized it from some of the other stuff too. I, I have to call out the golden book, Spine Aesthetic. Yeah. I like Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, and I like that, it. Well, that was me. That was just, you know, Liz and I have been like a super tag team. Obviously, I haven't worked on work with too many people who have interpreted my writing so when you meet someone like Jen Mangle who just gets me even though she could be my granddaughter let's face it she's 24 I'm 124 it's shocking but I knew the day that she told me that when her dad left their family she stole his class records I knew we were going to get along Liz and I also get along in a similar way But I was a bit sneaky with Liz. I knew she was a phenomenal cartoonist. I mean, her comedic timing is second to none. So I hired her not only because her art looks like 1950s Peanuts, which is my favorite Charles Schultz style. Yes. But I knew she was going to take my mediocre writing and then she was just going to do things like this, you know, just make it look so good on the page. You know, Mm -hmm. she just is so funny. and every suggestion she's made to change a story has taken it up three notches. She, um, she had some ideas for the story about bug juice and Mm -hmm. it's just phenomenal. So that's collaborating in comics. It's letting go Mm -hmm. of sometimes what you see in your head 
and letting the artist show you maybe a better way to put it on the page and not just saying, oh, okay, let's do that. But saying, yes, give me more feedback because comics are liquid. And that's the other thing that I think people forget. And you have to let the next person in the chain do their stuff. That's how you get great art. Totally agree. Yeah. I think when you try to like rank, like, kind of corral somebody into what you think they should be doing it's like it you're just limiting what something can be you know like limiting the greatness uh so yeah i'm very excited for the book and and since it's three issues like are you going to do each issue kickstarter how what is the frequency that you kind of want to do them yeah i was hoping to so the first issue it's all it's black and white it's 24 pages but we have a stretch goal to get us to 32 pages we are having some slow funding these days and i'm going to blame market saturation there are a lot of projects right now on kickstarter and there's a lot of good stuff and we all have a limited bank account so i'm not taking it personally i do think that all ages books are a tough sell when you're known for books that are teaching tools like i am so you know i'm not getting frustrated by it i'm disappointed but fingers crossed we'll still fund the first issue is done. So anyone that's listening or watching right now that wonders when the book's going to come out. Well, my new thing now is to do dummy books that look like this. And my favorite thing to use is glue stick. So I take the format that works for me, which is my six by nine. I print out the pages in black and white. I cut them and paste them because like I said, Ryan, I'm, I was big into arts and crafts. I won the sewing award in 1980 at Camp Akiba. And there's a big part of that that comes out in the comics. So I'm not going to say anymore, but if, if you've seen the movie Carrie, I'm, I'm not going to say there was pig's blood, but I'm going to say <laughs> there was drama, but I make the dummy book and this is what the comic will look like. It's going to be black and white. It's done. So you might even have it for Christmas to give to your daughter, but it will be done by the end of the year. The second issue is being drawn. I've written most of the stories. The mm-hmm. third issue is still in my head. But we hope to have the whole book finished and kickstarted by the early part of next year. Awesome. Very awesome. I can't wait. I do, before um, we wrap up, because I know you got to go, what's the deal with the third book in the trilogy? I'm just curious, like, in terms of, okay, you did 20% uh, comics, 80%, 80%, 20%. You, like, did that. So what is the third one going to entail? You don't have to give too much away, because I know you want to spoil it. It's something different for sure, because like at that 80, 20, 20, 80, I've done it, right? So Mm -hmm. can't go back. I Doppelganger has a subtitle and the other books have subtitles too, but this one is really important. It's Portrait of the Comic Book Editor in the 21st Century. It's my life from 2000, which I call Disco 2000 because Jarvis Cocker, right? Why not? I have to. So it's my life from Disco 2000 to present day. And it's it's tough to write because the industry has been in flux since the turn of the new century. And I want to show that both in terms of what I went through and what I've become and who I've become. And there were a lot of life changes, too. So it's definitely definitely very different. It's going to be probably the same amount of illustrative prose sequential storytelling as fast times, maybe a little bit more. It might be more of a 50-50, but I will go through and Jen Mangle is is in the role of illustrator and even editor with oh, wow. this one because she has challenged me. And my favorite part about it that I will share with you is that each chapter is about busting tropes. So we'll look at eight tropes in comics. My favorite is dynamic duos. And, and I'm not talking to superhero, by the way. I will go through each chapter and I will bust a trope. And what do I mean by that? Well, I will look at a comics trope like Deus Ex Machina, like dynamic duos, good versus evil. And I will subvert it to show people how what we've come to expect, expect from these things is not what I do and how that can make a tried and true trope interesting. So okay. that's one part that I've never revealed to anyone. So you've got it here first because you're awesome. Thank you're you. the best. And thank you for your 
inspiration and your enthusiasm for all my work and your show is great. And I am happy to come back anytime to spill my secrets. I'm always happy to have you. And we're definitely going to do some, uh, don't know the way, what I'm going to call it yet, but we're definitely going to be doing some flip throughs of all the books that you've done. So I'm very excited to do that with you. Everybody listening, watching, get out there back to Kickstarter is only a couple days left. Let's make this come out. I want to see the next issues. And Shelly, as always, it's a pleasure hanging out with you. I love it. Awesome. You too. Cheers, Ryan.